tonight uh, we have a very remarkable guest. Uh, uh, she's a professor, she is a writer, she's actually an award uh, winner writer, and she's also a filmmaker. And uh, today what we are going to discuss is what happens when the press fails, how our democratic society is affected uh, when the press fails. Carol, thank you very much for coming here My tonight. pleasure. Well, I just would like to start uh, with your experience uh, about the Vietnam War. So, uh, like many thinkers and activists of your generation, uh, I understand that Vietnam War great, greatly influenced your uh, worldview and scholarly path. Starting with the Vietnam War and continuing to the pre present day, there has been a contentious debate uh, over the actions and influence of the American news media on the course and outcome of the conflict. Can you please tell us about that? What was the problem at that time? Well, there's a, there's a popular belief that the media lost the American War in Vietnam, or it's called the American War in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, and that belief um, has some truth to it. It's certainly something the American government and the Pentagon believe. So subsequent to Vietnam, there's been a lot more restriction on the press. Mm -hmm. But I think it's probably more accurate to talk about the relationship between the press and the government, or the media and the government. And um, in, in, in U.S. history, um, in, in World War I, nobody was allowed at the front. So most of what we know about World War I, we know from fiction like Hemingway, or semi-fiction, um, uh, Farewell to Arms, or uh, Eric Remarque's uh, incredible, incredible memoir that became an incredible um, film. So, I um, censorship, uh, the relationship between the news media and the government and war is, probably goes back to time immemorial. In World War II, um, there was an office of censorship in the U.S. and, and, and the, the reporters during that time, the most famous being Ernie Pyle and Edward Murrow, and um, you know, they were very much on the home team. There wasn't really much of a um, much dissension about it. we had to win. The Allies had to win this war, and so um, the press and the government and Hollywood and the government worked hand in hand, uh, including the series of wonderful uh, sort of propaganda or motivational films we call them by um, uh, Frank, Frank Capra um, mm -hmm. on uh, it. The, uh, uh, Korea, right? I'm mm -hmm. fast forwarding a little bit, but this is kind of relevant background was where things began to fall apart a little bit more because at the beginning of the Korean War, which was 1950, mm -hmm. which was a messy, ugly, kind of awful, this was during, you cannot overestimate how the Cold War influenced American thinking and how mm -hmm. this fear of communism, I mean, you know, I grew up when we, put, we had to take do nuclear attack drills mm -hmm. and put our heads under our desks and, mm -hmm. you know, so there was a tremendous um, a fear of communism. I was really surprised when I, when I just noticed the media coverage of the uh, report of the UN about the Flotilla incident, mm -hmm. you remember. So it was a very big incident at the end of May, you know, nine people, nine Turkish people, actually one of them was American. an American teenager. So, and you... United Nations uh, Human Rights Council just announced its report about that. Mm -hmm. And I just remember that the New York Times covered that uh, story just as a paragraph in the ninth page, probably. 20, 20, 20, 20, 25, sorry, I think. 25, it was, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> as you see, the, I mean, this system, uh, and this policy is everywhere, I mean, as far as I see. Don't you, uh, well, why do you think? I, you know, I, I don't know. Well, we mm -hmm. talked about this earlier, about right. why that coverage was buried like that. Um, I, you know, no, I don't think it's a Jewish conspiracy in the media to keep it on the back pages. I mean, that's, we, that's a fast oversimplification Absolutely. of a very Enough complicated thing. But I think that this incident is so interesting as it unfolds. You know, the Israeli military put something like 20 videos up on YouTube. And one of our colleagues sent us a video that was on YouTube that mm -hmm. was probably made by the Israeli military. Probably. It certainly looked like it was. But it was very well done. Mm -hmm. 
It was, it was very professional, and it was very persuasive. It didn't have any source, right? So you couldn't really talk, think about the bias. You had to kind of deconstruct it. But I think as things go forward, there's another UN mm -hmm. report that's, that's, coming, mm -hmm. that's coming out at some point. Um, I, the coverage of that internationally, that incident, both uh, in the U.S. in particular, and why it's been so, so buried, is, it would mm -hmm. be an interesting thing to... Yeah. I mean, when we talk about Facebook, you know, Twitter, and I mean, these are the new mediums. So, uh, do you think? I mean, how do you think that this, these new mediums are going to affect the media landscape, media environment? So, uh, you know, Chomsky's model. I mean, if is it going to be functional again? Because you know, the individuals are going to be more affected in this new media in Well, Ireland. yeah, it's going to be used for propaganda, too, but I think, you know, the, the jury is really out on how Twitter and uh, you know, all these things are going to influence politics. We know that in the 2008 presidential election, it was a huge, uh, Barack mm -hmm. Obama marshaled a huge <laughs> online, uh, that's what elected him, essentially. I mean, it was brilliant for the way that they, they did that, just like a battle plan. Um, on the other hand, uh, there was a piece in the New Yorker a couple of weeks ago by Malcolm Gladwell. I don't always agree with him, but I kind of agreed with this, where he was saying, you know, the, re the revolution won't be Twittered. And th the point he was making was that the Twitter uh, or Facebook, the ties that you have through there, like there are two million people in the Save Darfur Facebook group who contributed an average of nine cents each. Um, so he, it, most of the twittering uh, during the crisis in Iran, where, where, where such a big deal was made of that, that there was a lot of twittering, was the Western, it wasn't even, you know, it. Uh, and so he's <laughs> saying that the ties that people have through those social media mm -hmm. are loose ties compared to, and he uses the example of the civil rights movement, and you know something where, where there were tight ties or a movement that kind of builds through sort of identification with each other and through strong leadership. And one point that he makes, uh, is, which is maybe a kind of conservative point, but I actually agree with him, that without some kind of leadership that these sort of social movement <coughs> things um, aren't going to really go anywhere online as, as they wouldn't go anywhere in lot, you know, on site. Media is a business. So how do you think that the advertising, advertising is affecting the object of journalism? So because they are addicted to revenues and the advertising. So how do you think that this relationship uh, is? Oh God, I mean, don't you hate, just don't you hate it? I mean, uh, if you watch television, if you watch anything, I think television is in a golden age, a second golden age. I think there's a lot of great television, great situation comedies, great dramas some good reality shows, but there are 20 minutes of commercial out of mm -hmm. uh, 40 minutes of show. It's, it's crazy. And it's certainly there are plenty of examples where uh, you know, corporate media have discouraged or fired or reporters. I can't think of anything really offhand. But as, as a reporter, and you probably know this yourself, you, know, you, don't, you may begin going to your editor or whatever and pitching this the story that you think is really kind of out of the box, and let's investigate that, and let's investigate that, and they go, mm, I don't, you know, I don't know, and you know, then, well, then you, but, but then you do it. Now the next time you kind of get discouraged and you don't do it. The next time you don't even go to the editor, and then it's like the dog that's on the kind of leash on the pole. You forget that you're on a leash, you know. So there's a self censorship that happens. So you don't even think about doing those stories anymore because you've been socialized. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like getting tenure in a university. You know, it's supposed to protect freedom of speech, but for the most part, by the time people get it, they have nothing left to say <laughs> because they've been so sort of socialized, so kind of compromised in a way, you mm -hmm. know, by the system. But that's sort of how the reporting thing works. It's really invisible, a lot yeah. of these. The leash is kind of, the dog doesn't know it's on a leash because it's not even trying to get away anymore. Mm -hmm.